Pleasure to, to welcome back the Grab, who is, who is no stranger to this, this event, this conference. He, he has been uh, presenting ahead in the box for the last, last, few, last few times, and welcome back. Uh, I'm sure some of you recognize him and remember him. For those who are new, maybe just a few words uh, about him. He's a domain expert on voice over IP, he has done extensive work on voice over IP the last few years, and also on digital forensic analysis and reverse engineering. But uh, I don't think he's talking about IP telephony to today. He's talking about something different, a new penetration, penetration testing tool that he has developed to bridge the gap between you know, plain vanilla command line hacking and GUI type of environments like Impact and Canvas. And uh, he's going to tell us about this new tool as well as the programming controls and features that's built into it, how one can extend it. So uh, let's give a, a warm applause for the grab. Um, I have to apologize beforehand. I've got a cold, so if I start like sneezing and coughing in the middle, uh, it's not you, it's me. Um, all right, so this is going to be a talk on a new type of tool which I've developed, which is a tool to help bridge the gap between uh, sort of pre-penetration and post-penetration tools. Um, it provides a lot of uh, anti-forensics capabilities, so I've called it a, a meta-anti-forensics tool. Um, and it's called HAT, uh, which is short for Hacker Shell, as opposed to the uh, like MD5 or SHA-1 cryptographic stuff. Uh, briefly, this is what we're going to go over. Um, it's a, a very, very short refresher on anti-forensics. Uh, it's just basically the, the principles and strategies to get everyone up to speed so that they know like uh, just the, the core basic stuff. Then I'm going to complain about hacking for a while. Uh, then we're going to talk about what a hacking harness is. So the tool that I've developed is a new class of tool which I'm calling a hacking harness, which is similar to a, a test harness, for those of you who are developers. Um, we can talk about the features of that uh, tool, implementation, and uh, then I've got some final thoughts. So very briefly about myself, uh, my name is Grug, independent security researcher. Uh, my core focus has been basically anti-forensics uh, since 1999 when I basically pioneered the field. Uh, if you do any research, you'll find that there's nothing published before me. And then there was a, a gap after I stopped. Then a whole bunch of people came out and stole my stuff without attributing it to me. And then you start seeing papers referencing the guys that stole my stuff. So um, I'm going to spend the next like year or two basically setting the record straight and showing how everyone's basically an idiot uh, and doesn't know anything about anti-forensics. Uh, I've also done a huge amount of telephony security over the last few years. And uh, I, I still do quite a fair amount of binary analysis because it's kind of fun. Uh, and I'm based in Thailand. All right. So this is our really, really, really short introduction to anti-forensics. Right. First of all, the principles of anti-forensics. Uh, the principle of anti-forensics is very, very simple. The idea is to reduce the quantity and quality of evidence available to a forensics investigator. So everything that you do must be done to reduce the amount of information that someone investigating you can use against you. Now, obviously, the earlier on that you can reduce that information, the better you are. So basically, if you can uh, stop someone from discovering that there's been a penetration, that's a lot better than someone not being able to investigate that penetration. Um, there's actually quite a lot of uh, confusion going on these days uh, with people talking about the difference between anti-forensics and anti-discovery. So the idea is that anti-discovery is tools such as uh, rootkits and so on, which prevent someone from detecting that there's been an incident, whereas anti-forensics are tools and techniques which are used specifically after someone has detected the incident and has be begun an investigation. Now, technically, that does make sense in that uh, forensics only, ex only exists within the context of an investigation. However, it doesn't make much sense to say that like, uh, basically limiting someone's knowledge of your penetration is not an anti-forensics technique because if you can limit someone's knowledge of your penetration you can stop them ever conducting the investigation which is a very effective way a very effective way of subverting a forensics investigation don't ever let it start um, all of that from one slide right so <clears throat> the other thing is that you have to remember that all data is evidence absolutely everything you do and everything that you don't do can and will be used against you uh, there's also various different levels of anti-forensics. So there's things that you do to make sure that like, uh, your boss doesn't find out that you're looking at football sites during the workday. 
and there's things that you do to make sure that the police don't put you in jail for looking at child porn. Right? Those are different levels of anti-forensic. So one thing that's sufficient to keep your boss from getting angry is probably not sufficient to keep you out of pound me in the ass jail. So there's levels and things. And it, it, a lot of it has to depend on how intelligent you believe your uh, forensics investigator is going to be. Um, short hint, if it's the police, they're idiots. You don't need to worry about them. And it's, if it's the FBI, they're idiots as well because they train the other idiots. Really, like, I wouldn't worry about it. Um, Okay, so fundamentally we, we're aware of the fact that data is evidence and we want to do everything we can to keep uh, evidence to the smallest amount possible. So, right, Woo What are the strategies that we can use to do that? Well, the simplest strategy is data destruction. It's actually also the most difficult to do properly. So data destruction is when you destroy data on the disk, okay? So there are several different techniques. Obviously you can use a hammer. Um, this is effective one time, but it limits the use of your laptop for uh, further activities. Um, you can use secure deletion, so there's a couple of secure delete tools out there, such as SRM and Wipe. Now, these tools are good in that they get rid of the content of a file, but they do not actually do complete data destruction. If there was complete data destruction, what they would be able to do is revert the file system to a state prior to the creation of that file. So the idea would be that proper data destruction would actually reset the file system back in time to before the file that you're trying to get rid of ever existed. So it's actually fairly complex to do properly. However, for the purposes of uh, subverting an investigation, you don't really need to do all that much. You just need to make it difficult for them to find what they're looking for, and you've basically won. Okay? Um, next up, we've got data hiding. Uh, data hiding is what I spent a lot of my time on because it's very exciting and very sexy. Um, Unfortunately, it's actually kind of difficult to do properly, and it doesn't get you much more than data destruction does. So data hiding is where you go out of your way to find bugs in forensics tools, which will allow you to put uh, data in areas that the forensics tools cannot find. And you'd be surprised at how many bugs there are like this. There's just really, really huge amounts. Uh, in fact, uh, almost all of the bugs which I found back in like 2002 uh, still exist today, five years later. So uh, not only do the bugs still exist, they, they're easy to find, but they never die. Uh, the one open source bug that I released for TCT took nine months to get patched. Right? Nine months for an open source tool. And that's the only bug I know of that has actually ever been patched. So data hiding is actually uh, quite complex to do. It is possible. But it's not really worth the effort, I think, these days, because uh, you may as well just use encryption and you're done with it, all right? Um, oh yeah, sorry, I, I need to talk very briefly about exploitation of forensics tools and why that's a fucking stupid idea. Uh, basically, there's recently been uh, ISEC partners uh, releasing a bunch of bugs that they found in a couple of tools, uh, SleuthKit and Encase, and talking about how these are new. Um, actually, that's not necessarily the case. There's been uh, a lot of bugs that you can exploit for memory corruption errors in forensics tools. But the reason that you don't want to do that is very simple. Basically, a lot of the uh, forensics investigators will use more than one tool. And if they have a problem, such as if like, the tool that they're using crashes while they look at a disk image, they will take that disk image and they will send it to the manufacturer of the tool. They'll send it to the vendor and they say, this disk image makes your tool crash. Fix it. And what happens then is the vendor finds the bug that you're trying to exploit. They fix the bug in their tool. And then they find all the stuff that you were trying to hide. Right? So one of, the, one of the core things to remember about anti-forensics is the, the short statement, aspire to subtlety. Right? Try to be subtle about everything. Don't go in there and fucking leave huge overflows that are going to crash things. And, like, that's stupid. You're just going to attract attention that way. You're trying to avoid attention. Okay. But the technique that we're going to be talking about, the strategy we're going to be talking about today is what I call data contraception. So data contraception is the anti-forensics uh, strategy whereby you try to prevent data from being created in the first place. Right? So you go out of your way to limit the amount of evidence that exists on the disk by simply limiting the amount of interaction you actually have with the disk. Now, traditionally, that's actually been fairly hard to do properly. You tend to run an exploit, you drop into a shell, and you are immediately affecting the disk. Then all of the things that you do, you have to then do data destruction attacks to clean up, such as you upload your rootkit, 
or um, you know, various other things that you do, you then have to go through and you have to clean up after yourself. And it gets quite difficult because you have to upload the cleaning tool and then try and upload a data destruction tool and then upload a cleaning tool for that and then another data destruction. Like, you have an annoying bootstrapping problem whereby you have to leave at least one tool behind. Right? So uh, I'm going to show you how we don't have to deal with that anymore. Um, the primary thing that you want to do is you want to keep everything that you're interfacing with, all of the things that you're doing, you want to keep them in memory. And the way that you keep them in memory is fairly simple. You can use uh, existing frameworks such as uh, Metasploit, which has an interpreter, uh, Core Impact, and Canvas all provide techniques for keeping, um, the, keeping the process that you're interacting with uh, available to you and purely in memory. But if you're not using those, then you're shit out of luck. So we'll look at how you can actually have that capability even if you're not using those, those uh, particular tool suites. So we're going to be talking about contraceptive hacking uh, and why you want to limit, the, limit your exposure to bareback and use a condom wherever possible. Um, so the idea is fundamentally you want to limit the number of custom tools that you use. If you use existing tools on the system, then you're not leaving behind evidence. You're not leaving behind evidentiary traces of things that you've done. Right? So if you use custom tools, then someone can start fingerprinting and say, all right, this guy always uses this, particularly bar this particular binary. Now, <clears throat> way back in the day, uh, in like 2001 and, and so, uh, I was working with Scott and we did work on creating encrypted binaries to limit the amount of information that people could get from binaries that they found on systems. Um, that's actually not all that cool, ultimately, because it's quite easy to figure out uh, where the problems are and to sniff passwords and so on. So th there were problems with the encrypted binary approach. Uh, it's much better to simply keep things uh, purely in memory to begin with. Right? The other thing to remember is cleaning things off the file system is very hard to do. So you're much better off never actually putting anything on the file system. So what we want is some sort of framework that allows us to keep everything in memory and make it easy for us to not put things on the file system. We're going to look at how to do that. And fundamentally, of course, stay off the disk. Right? Much like keep off the crafts. OK, so some thoughts on hacking. So everyone's like fairly comfortable with the general broad background on anti-forensics. You've got an idea that like you can destroy things, you can hide things, and you can keep them off the disk. You can keep them from being created. So now then, uh, why do we care about all this stuff? OK, so here, with apologies to Napoleon. Hacking is a contest of blunders. He who makes the least wins. Right? So when you're hacking things, you're trying to reduce the number of fuck ups that you make so that you can keep the other people, so you can keep the system administrators from detecting you. Right? Generally speaking, the only way you're going to get caught is when you make mistakes. So if you limit the amount of mistakes that you make, you reduce the likelihood of going to jail. All right. So if we look at hacking tools in general, I basically classify them into sort of three types of tool. You've got pre-penetration tools. So you've got tools which can help you find bugs that can allow you to do penetrations. So we've got all the terribly exciting fuzzers, uh, binary analysis, source auditing, and so on. You've got all of these tools which will help you find bugs that will help you actually commit a penetration. Um, there's a really dirty joke in there somewhere which I'll avoid. Okay, then you actually have penetration tools. You've got tools which help you during the penetration phase. So you have uh, exploit frameworks which allow you to use uh, pre-written uh, pre ex exploits or make it easier for you to write your own exploits. You have uh, like SQL injection frameworks more of those. Like basically there's a whole bunch of tools out there for penetration stuff, right, for actually breaking in. And then finally you have the post-penetration phase. So the post-penetration phase is after you've actually gone in, in and now you're going to do the exciting stuff. Now as a penetration tester, this is usually the end of your work, right? As soon as you get in, you're done. Whereas as a hacker, as soon as you get in, you start, right? This is where things start for a hacker. And which, this is why it's actually so shocking that there are no tools out there to really help this phase. So uh, the, the basic tools that we have for the post-penetration phase are rootkits, which basically hide your presence on the system, and backdoors, which uh, prevent you from, ha which basically save you the trouble of having to go through all the pre-penetration and penetration steps again from scratch. But there's actually nothing out there to simply help you in the post-penetration phase, right? 